Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I'm with Rob Nichols. Rob is a portfolio CFO. Um, you've been on the podcast before and you were brave enough to come back. Mm -hmm. What possessed you, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> it's not far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not far. Um, we have a half decent biscuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so Rob, thanks for coming back. There's a lot going on in the world right now. And we were talking about this a little bit right. earlier. We've got recession, we've got inflation, we've got um, how long, you know, somebody's predicting a 12-month inflation, uh, 12 month in recession, the Bank of England's like, oh, we're all doomed. What's your take on where we are at the moment? Well, I think today, you know, early September, at least we have a government now. Mm -hmm. So that's positive. It's a good sign. But, you know, it was six months ago, I think I was down here last, and I think we're in a whole different place. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily a better place. I think there's... Um, Something of a bifurcation in terms of the market. If you're B to C, you've got a few more worries. If you're B to B, I think you're going to be okay. And um, there's a few signs already that people are changing their behavior in terms of spending, what they're doing, because of the fear over energy prices, cost of living, so forth, inflation. Um, but the jobs market is still pretty robust as well. Mm -hmm. Lots of my clients are recruiting and oftentimes can't get new staff, having to pay good salaries now. Um, and, and you've got to think differently to bring people on. So we're in a different place than we were six months ago. Um, I think we're probably in a recession, if not going into one. We probably will get, be in one probably till the end of March next year, I suspect. Um, but I think coming out of it, we're going to be weak here in the UK. Our markets in Europe are weak. Um, the US is doing very differently. I spent a lot of time looking at the US, lived and worked at there for a number of years. They're going to be fine. Um, I think they are denying it to some extent, but they're going to be fine. They're going to be okay. fine. The markets are fine. So we've not had a good old fashioned recession mm. since 2008, 2009. Right. Yeah. And interestingly, if a big chunk, it's something like 34% of the workforce, in the UK, some big number like that, weren't even in the workforce, right. weren't even adults right. when the last recession happened. So there's, there's this whole mystery yeah. about what a recession is, what does it look like, what it feels, smells like. Just in case, mm -hmm. you know, you read the stories of, well, you don't remember it now, but there was many people have forgotten the fact that people were queuing outside banks and all that kind of stuff. Is it going to be a recession like that? No, I don't think it is. I think it's going to be a different type of downturn. Um, I mean, B2B businesses, a lot of companies across the UK are still hiring. There's still plenty of jobs out there. But I think it is going to be a different type of recession. The banks have got lots of liquidity. I was talking to someone just yesterday. They picked up a nice little commercial loan for a, um, a building in Devon. No problem at all. Good rates. So the liquidity is out there. It's not going to be the same type of recession mm -hmm. we had last time. It is going to be the consumers that are going to pull back to some extent. But businesses still have access to money. They're still going ahead with uh, transactions, with hiring. There's still lots of opportunity out there. There's good markets as well if you're looking in the right place. There is always opportunity out there. If you're looking at the US, um, parts of the Middle East and Africa, parts of Asia are fine. Europe mm -hmm. is tricky at the moment. So, you know, I always look to see where the money is coming from and the banks are fine. Okay. So it's, it's, I think that's good. You can get a loan, whether it's a personal loan or a commercial loan, and rates are still pretty good. You know, you and I might remember, you know, mortgage rates in the double digits. Well, that's yeah. not going to happen anytime soon. House that would cause different. a 2008 that probably would. That probably would. You know, but it is a different type of recession. I think we'll be through it in three to six months. I think it'll be okay. I don't think it'll be too painful. So are you think like a little good. dip, like um, 1%, something like that? I think there'll be a couple of quarters of negative growth, but I don't think it'll be severe. And I think we'll come out of it okay. And to be honest, there's a lot of things that need to happen during a recession. Prices need to come down, salary expectations need to come down, um, a number of corrections need to happen, maybe some jobs need to be not eliminated, but just disappear, if you will. So a recession can be good for industry, for businesses, mm -hmm. and it'll be a time when a lot of businesses will double down, will spend some more money around marketing, um, other places, which will put them in good stead when we come out of this, probably the second half of, of next year, I think. I mean, a recession is tough, 
And for individuals mm -hmm. affected, mm -hmm. like, you know, if one person loses their job, it's pretty brutal. Right. But when we're talking about a dip, we're not talking about markets collapsing. We're talking about, you know, a few people spending less or lots of people spending a bit less, but there's still people buying. Right. So if you want to get through a recession, you don't just go and accept it and roll over. You have to go, well, we have to fight a little harder and that's, what crust. and that's what businesses, I think, are looking at doing. They're reevaluating what their plans are, what they can do with what they've got. Because right now you can't find people. There's an awful lot of people that have just exited the workforce, whether it's at the um, more experienced end or the younger age. People are sort of sheltering in um, in, uh, in academia. They've gone back to school a lot of them or they just don't mm. want to work. So there's a lot of things that people are doing right now that will insulate them from the pain of of, of any consumer cutting back. But I don't think, and I get no sense at the moment, that businesses are significantly cutting back on things mm. like training, marketing, spending, um, building facilities and going out there. There's plenty of business going on out there, mm. but it will change. And you do need to be cognizant of the big picture, I think. Yeah. A lot of businesses in the UK probably aren't quite as aware of the bigger picture as they should be in mm. terms of what's going on, what are the banks doing, where is industry looking to move? And things will change. Things mm. will change significantly, potentially yeah. in some areas. And any things that we should be looking closely at? If somebody goes, Rob's just said things will change, <laughs> just to put you on the spot, what are some of the things they should be looking at? Um, I, think, uh, I think you should be looking at new markets. Where is... You know, there's, a, there's the phrase of skating to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. You need to be looking ahead, you know, to the end of next year. Where is the market of your industry or your business going to be? And you need to put yourself in a place that will capitalize on that. So that might be doing things around demand generation, creating new demand, and get a redeploying resources from doing X to doing Y. And I think that's one thing a lot of businesses don't do. They sit with a, a plan or a budget and they just stick with that for six, nine, 12 months, mm -hmm. you got to change. And I've, I was talking to a, a client this morning that they've got a budget and they've got a line item with X amount of dollars in there to spend, pounds in there to spend, and they haven't really changed it for eight months yet. So we need to change and move some of those pounds to other buckets to really be in a right mm -hmm. place for next year. So in terms of spending on, in this case, it was CRM, putting a CRM system in place, which will cost a few dollars to put in place, but we need to do it because we need to capture the demand of where the business is going to be mm -hmm. 12 months from now. Again, I was talking to a client yesterday who's moving out of a, a building, a, 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 use, a, a shared leased building in Exeter, actually, and buying their own building just off the M5. So there are people doing stuff construction going on and moving ahead if you're in the right place. Now, they're in the renewable space, but there are lots of places that you can move to that are moving faster than perhaps your existing business. Mm -hmm. um, and that's quite exciting, but you've got to be willing to change and you've got to see where that change is coming from and going to, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So um, you're obviously um, heavily involved in helping people kind of... Um, kind of run their businesses better. We had this conversation about your your you're a CFO with a personality. Uh -huh. Um you're not just looking at bean counting because right, I yeah. know um I can tell you one organization I worked with and um this is not a diss to every FD CFO by the way. But sometimes it's like the gray suits kind of thing. Right. And it comes down to brass tacks of Okay, that's a lot of money. We're not doing it. Right. But there's some that, things you have to kind of do to make money. Right, absolutely. I think the profession is changing. It's no longer driving looking in the rearview mirror. It's driving looking through the, the windscreen mm. up front. And that's where finance and business finance and strategic finance is. And that's where they're looking to partner with the business owner, CEO, MD. So that's where we're going. It's really a partnership now, a strategic partnership, putting all the pieces in place to drive the business forward. So to grow sales, increase your profitability, increase your margins, 
and create value. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about now, and that's where the industry is, is the, the profession is going. So it, it's different, and you need a different type of CFO or FD in your business. Mm -hmm. I often think it, it is the first hire uh, a new startup should be looking one, two, three people. You need someone who's looking at the numbers pretty quickly because mm -hmm. that's the narrative you need to be telling, the story you need to be telling investors, your stakeholders, your employees, and your customers and clients because they need to know you're going to be around 12 months from now to provide the product or service that mm. you, you're, you're providing them. They need to be confident of that. And, you know, we're going into a recession potentially here. So you need to know that your supplier is going to be coming out the other end of this mm. in six or nine months' time, be able mm. to do and support you in going forward. One of the things we've started to do, and um, we should have done it a long time ago, but in the last six months or so, is our finance team now track the sales pipeline. Mm-hmm. Not because of any individual deal or customer, but they can give, based on historical data, they go, if that's in the pipeline, that's what this means going forward. Right, you can forecast. I mean, yeah. I'm a big proponent of looking at adopting a CRM system. And, and I'm in my hub spot every day. Mm -hmm. I'm in my client's CRM most days as well to look at the pipeline, looking at what we're building. So I can start then forecast what sales are going to look like. Are we going to meet our forecast in September? Are we going to meet our forecast in Q4? So it is very important that not just your sales and marketing folks are in the CRM system and looking at what the pipeline is looking at. And, and you and I as the mm -hmm. business owner and CFO are looking at it as well because we need mm -hmm. to be playing with the levers that adapt to yeah. the volume of business. So, you know, if I can see there's a spike coming in the fourth quarter, October through December, we need another headcount in mm -hmm. place to support that customer coming on board. Again, talking to a client this morning, they've got several new clients in the pipeline, in the CRM that are advancing, and they'll be ready to come on board in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. So we need to have the people in place to support that business going forward because if we want to book that revenue in the fourth quarter, we've got to have the people in place probably 30 to 60 days before that. Mm -hmm. So. I'm heavily involved in that as well, and, and I would encourage all uh, finance groups to be similarly. Even the parts of the business where there isn't a hard number, there is a bellwether from a number. So, for an example, we know we know things like, for an example, if we get a certain number of sales calls, the, that transa translates to a certain number of quotes and a certain... And after time, you can kind of look at that and go, actually... Sure. You know, it's always variable and you don't know mm -hmm. how good or bad something is just top level, but right. you can have an indication of historical data of going, OK, if this many sales come in, the sales right. calls come in, this this is how many proposals roughly. This is what the revenue number looks like. Right. And then you're not kind of just going on one deal. You're going off the the pattern that you've seen. In well, the this is where your team has got to work together, both sales and marketing and finance as a partnership. So we can look at your conversion rate. So, you know, if your plan is to do 250K in the month of September, I need to see that there's over 500K of pipeline deals to ensure that if you're going to convert 50%, you're going to book 250K in the mm -hmm. month of September, and then we'll make plan for the month of September. But equally, you know, I need to be looking at October through December. What's the plan for that 90-day period? Yeah. What is the, the, the plan that we set, you know, six or nine months ago? What is the forecast? And what does the pipeline actually look like based on our conversion rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the forecast might be 250K. The pipeline may say we've got 300K and we're converting at 50%. So our outlook is way under the mark. So mm -hmm. what are you doing, Dean, and key, to pick up key on key on that is the marketing piece. If we think sales is a bellwether of, uh, sorry, sales activity, proposals, is a bellwether of revenue, then actually marketing is almost like three months right. down the line. Yeah, you're creating the demand. The marketing yeah. function is creating that demand. And I, as a CFO, need to see that marketing is creating that demand. So I'm going to be intimately involved in what marketing are doing mm -hmm. to ensure that I can get the return out of investment of the spend on marketing for sales to then convert it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that sales marketing function is one and the same thing. But you're going to have to get very close with your finance partner and your CFO or your FD or your finance manager to make that happen. And it needs to be, everyone needs to be singing off the same song sheet, if you will. Um, and I'll be testing the marketing group, as I do with all my clients, 
What do you do to create demand? How are you creating demand? And then how are we converting it? And how can we increase that conversion rate? You know, if we're only converting one out of every two clients that comes in the door, why is that? Are we following up on the one client that didn't convert? Mm -hmm. Have we got any conversation going on with that person? Who's doing that? Who's responsible to it? Are they incentivized sufficiently? You know, are we are we dropping a hundred pounds in the paycheck of someone who can then bring a client that we didn't convert six months ago on board? Because I want that revenue. Because mm -hmm. I need that revenue to meet the plan number in order to make our margins sing and our profitability to be what we planned and to create the value in the business that we think we can do and. and I want to create for, for the business owner. Mm -hmm. So big big challenges for business as well. Obviously, they want to keep growing. There's a potential recession on the horizon. We already might be in it. Where we always find out these things after the event anyway. Right. Um, how does a business, you know, through the pandemic, it was very unpredictable. You didn't know what was going to happen. And, and effectively, the government was telling you when and how you could operate your business. Right, right. Which... As a business owner, you're used to having risks, but they're risks that you are responsible for. You could set a plan in place and then the government could say, sorry, we're changing everything again. So that was horrendous for people. And people are now going into high energy costs, although it looks like some of that's going to be sorted out. Uh, we've still got a bit of inflation, although inflation will probably cut fall as well because mm -hmm. energy is not going up as much or at least it will stabilize where it is. And you've had um, wage inflation go absolutely nuts. Yeah. Um, and I understand why, because everybody's cost of living's increased, but it's actually made, I don't think we've gained productivity from that wage inflation either. No, I agree. I think uh, productivity is flatlined pretty much for the last 10 years. And I don't think we've gained anything over the last six to nine months kind of thing. And it is going to be a focus because that's how you create wealth through productivity. So there is going to have to be a focus on that going forward for sure. But as you, um, I mean, how do you, how do you change productivity? Well, you, you've got to create wealth and you've got to create wealth by doing more. So that's automation, that's reducing costs. I mean, there's less people in the workforce now than there were two years ago. And so business have got to create the same amount of wealth, sales, profits from a smaller pot of, of resources. So you're going to have to do more automation, uh, more outsourcing to other locations that perhaps have a lower cost. So I've just outsourced some of our IT support to with a client to South Africa, um, funnily enough, which is not a country I've outsourced to before because it generally is a lower cost and we can get a good standard of, of support. So it is going to be beholden to all businesses to upscale and create value. And you create value by creating, generating margins and profitability and increase the value of your business uh, over time. So when we look at things like, you know, administration, repetitive tasks within a business that currently might be done by a human, mm -hmm. there's an element of, well, what happens to that human? And this is kind of a big problem across the whole country is the more businesses gain efficiency in mm -hmm. terms of, yeah, we can get a robot to process those documents or this or that or the other. What happens to those people? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's the cycle of business. In you know, 20, 30 years ago, there were no webmasters. There was no social media. They mm -hmm. just didn't exist. So a lot of the people that are going to be displaced, and there will be people that are displaced, whether it's in retail shops, they'll, they'll go and do something different, probably at a higher wage, probably with more benefits. So it will happen, and there will be a, a sense of retraining. We're not particularly good at retraining and, and repurposing people in Europe in the US, it's much better. People will literally will pivot from a Friday doing something to a Monday morning, I'll do something different. So we need to generate a little bit more of that flexible mindset. But there will have to be people that decide that, you know, social media is the place to be or was a year or two ago, we need to get into it. Because if you're coming into it today, you're probably a bit late. But there will be as we come out of a recession, again, there will be new roles, new opportunities that people will have to retool for. There'll be, you know, existing opportunities as well, but there'll be new 
roles out there, whether it's in engineering, in finance. I mean, finance is changing as much as anywhere. Um, it's all going to the cloud. You shouldn't have a standalone finance system that's managed internally, um, just like you shouldn't be running your business on a, a, an Excel spreadsheet that's used on your on your desktop. You should be back it up. You should be using a, a cloud-based software CRM mm. solution. So that's going to create opportunities. You know, you look at some of these companies like HubSpot, for example, are creating jobs out of nowhere in places like Dublin and and, and mm. Berlin. Huge opportunities being created, and they are desperate for people. So you know, if you're working in a shop in Berlin or Dublin, there's probably better opportunities for you to use your skills to develop a, a different career trajectory and in some of these new businesses. I suppose there. personally in a, in a down like a business in a downturn has to adapt to what they see. Otherwise they die. Sure. And it's brutal because obviously a person is a person. Right. But fundamentally it's the same point, isn't it? If you're you can see the headwinds is that this kind of work is eventually going to be done by a robot. Right. I either sit and wait for that to happen. Right. Or I go I'm going to do something a robot can't do. And it's the people who recognize that head of the game that have got the right attitude and they're willing to inflect to a different um, place and go back to school and retrain because they can see they, they perhaps can have better opportunities and better earnings going forward because what you're doing now is just going to become, you know, shop work, for example, working in a retail store is going to be difficult going forward. You know, there's a lot less opportunities but you can probably earn 50% more doing something similar but different in an Amazon warehouse, if you will, if that's the right opportunity for you. And there's a lot of people I, I've worked with over the last couple of years that were into social media that are earning significant six-figure six figure salaries now doing different things around engineering, startups. Um, startups is another whole world that, you know, mm. if you found a better way of doing something, a better mousetrap, you should go and do it right now because this is the perfect time to invest six or nine months into something that you really want to do um, that could change whatever it may be, whether it's finance, marketing, how we put a wheel on a car, whatever it is. If you've got an idea, this is the perfect time to start looking to invest in that time, effort, money, going back to college. There's plenty of money out there and plenty of accelerators that will support you to grow a new business. So if you've got an idea, I think this is a really good time to, to pursue that, if you will. It's interesting, isn't it? Because recessions create gaps. They create um, gaps as businesses adapt or people businesses right. pull away from particular service offerings or uh, decide that this division isn't profitable anymore. It creates a gap in the market. And during a recession, people tend to try and find a more efficient way of doing things. It actually creates a lot of opportunities if you're willing to look for them. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, business is, a, is brilliant at filling gaps. You know, if, if you create rules and laws and instructions, banks will find ways to adapt to that and make money in that new environment. People and businesses are brilliant at adapting. So, you know, it may be painful going into it during that period of time. Mm -hmm. But there will be opportunities coming out of it, and it's beholden to people like you and I and others, business leaders, to figure out what those opportunities are and go and fill that gap. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a product or a service that just doesn't exist today, social media didn't exist 10 mm -hmm. years ago, really. Um, well, they did to it 15 years ago, perhaps. But... You know, it's developed way beyond where it was when we jumped on LinkedIn yeah. and, 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 and social the, media. The CV in side. 2005, 2006, yeah. it's changed dramatically. And the number of people that have come out of the woodwork that are in this world now is just incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. it's probably 100 times what it was even five years ago. Yeah. Um, so those opportunities will get filled. Those business opportunities will get filled because people and businesses are brilliant at adapting to I say whatever it is, whether it's business circumstances, laws, legislation. Um, I mean, banks are some of the best organizations. Then they are just people who have resources that have adapted to regulation back in 2010, 12, mm -hmm. that have adapted remarkably to create huge businesses and very, very profitable, high margin businesses and significant value. So talking about adapting and efficiency. The other day, I sent some paperwork off to HMRC, right? Yeah. Don't hold your breath. Well, apparently it takes them 148 days to process a letter. Um, but this one was pretty quick. They processed the information. 
and then sent me a, a letter back and I needed to uh, so I rang them up because I thought it'd be quicker than waiting another 148 days. Mm-hmm. Um, so I rang them up and said, oh, do you, that's all sorted. But they, were, they, they asked me for something else on the phone. And I said, that's in that document that I sent you. It's all in there. Yeah, I can see it's there. But you have to do, that has to be raised as a separate thing. So I'm like, are you seriously telling me you've got the information, you can see the information, but you cannot move that from that kind of query, that ticket, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to this ticket? No, no, you'll have to submit it again. <laughs> I'm like, okay. how, how do we fix the fact that government is horrendously, horrendously inefficient? Yeah, well, uh, it hasn't happened yet, so I guess I, I'm not, you know, overtly, you know, happy or, or, or feel good that it's going to happen going forward. Bearing in mind that the UK government actually isn't as bad as some other governments. I lived and worked in the US for 25 years, and the US government is absolutely appalling at all manner of digitalized digitalization of processing and systems but they can get money into your bank account uh, kind of thing very quickly so if it's needed so they can react when they need to they need to be incentivized to do so and i don't think parts of some of the agencies and several civil servants are incentivized in the right way shape or form there, there has been some outsourcing of, of functions I think they need to do a lot more. They, the first scheme do. was incredible. The speed that that ran at was unreal. Mm-hmm. But then you look at 148 days to to deal with a letter. I had someone um, bring to my attention a couple of weeks ago that you know it take it had taken HMRC 18 months to respond to a customer query that someone had put with them. So I think HMRC are probably one of the worst mm-hmm. organizations. You know, DVLC is probably another one. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it is worse in other places. You know, mm-hmm. we, we hold our, our agencies to a fairly high standard, and rightly so. But, you know, there are there are worse places to be, believe me. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been sat in DVLC in, in, in the U.S. for literally hours and hours just waiting for for documents to come out the other end it, it it's, it's no different anywhere else right okay be nice if it was a bit more efficient though wouldn't it it would be, be nice would be brilliant because i think i think a lot of i mean the whole world of accounting yeah makes you know there's the compliance submitting all that stuff but then there's the minefield of all the countless right. tax rules and i'm hoping our new prime minister i don't know whether she's going to be good bad or ugly in terms of what she does but she has said she would straight streamline some of this whole tax system and all that kind of stuff, yeah. which it is a minefield. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I'm not holding my breath on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Rob, what are some of the things that, um, from a business point of view, um, you're looking at all of these headwinds. We've talked about adapting, finding gaps and all that kind of stuff. What are some of the other things that you see a lot of businesses doing at the moment that might be useful or warning signs for other people? I think a lot of businesses um, have closed in over the last year or two, you know, with a whole uh, COVID lockdown and, and Brexit. And a lot of businesses looked in, got their heads down and just kind of focus on on what they were doing. And I think a lot of businesses, a lot of business leaders need to kind of open up a little bit more, think a little bit more strategic, if that's the right word, and look at things that they haven't done over the last couple of years. And those are things like partnerships, strategic alliances, collaboration with competitors potentially. So I, 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 nothing is off off the off the the, uh, the agenda for me. So you know whether it's a, a competitor that wants to work together to share resources to go after a bigger market, um, that's the sort of thing you should be doing. All businesses should, I believe, be looking to build partnerships and strategic alliances and opportunities with other agencies. I've got a client that's that's got a wonderful business that is just starting to get into a whole new um, uh, area of demand for their products, uh, working with an insurance company to leverage a relationship that we've only started in the last 12 months or so. So again, that's an early opportunity, but it, it it bodes well mm-hmm. in terms of giving some sort of reciprocity between opportunities. So, you know, if I put a client to you, um, I can sell my business, my services into that. There'll be an opportunity to share resources and share opportunities and share data as well. I think that's something that the UK is particularly not very good at. 
And I think with the changes that we've had with the markets we're competing in, not so much competing in Europe now, we need to look at other potentially English-speaking markets like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, North America, um, looking at opportunities for alliances. And that's a very, very quick way and a relatively low-cost way to improve sales, margins, profitability, and value in your business by looking to, to link up with someone else who's in a similar but maybe adjacent market. We just don't do enough of that at the moment. Mm. So I, I hope businesses are going to look to do a lot more of that going forward because they're going to probably need to. Uh, and this is probably a good time to be looking at those opportunities as well. Mm. So strategic alliances, partnership, collaboration, look at what else is out there as well. Look at other markets that you'd like to get into, whether it's geographical markets or a product or services that are adjacent to the markets you're in. So I have a one client that, that deals primarily in one very specific industry segment, but he's got a whole raft of commercial opportunities that we weren't he he wasn't even really looking at that is probably going to d double the potential um, uh, total available market or TAM that is available to the business. So I think you need to look up and, and cast your eyes across the horizon, look what's out there and mm. go after it, whether that's geographical markets or the type of product uh, the services that you can offer. Another client that is that is moving into a consultancy world service rather than just a day-to-day -day bread and butter IT services support business. So they're moving into that higher value, higher margin, um, potentially higher profitability um, uh, consultancy type approach. And that's a, a very good approach to take because it's mm -hmm. going to create value in their business. It won't, it won't happen overnight, but over time, over the next six to 12 months, I think there's a significant opportunity to inflect to a different type of business mm -hmm. model. Uh, that they hadn't done for, for many years. And may not have thought about without the disruption. Perhaps, perhaps. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on a light note. We're not going to end on a light note. Russia. Yeah. Come on, Rob, what do you think? I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. You know, we're six months or more into it now. Um, I think the Russian economy is basically flattened it back on its back. It doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to accept it. The ruble is a non-tradable currency. The dollar at the moment is sky high at a, probably an all-time high. Will, and the pound against the dollar will probably hit parity, I suspect, within the next six to nine months. But it all goes to the fact that Russia is being bled dry. And I think in about, I think by this time next year, there'll be a conclusion, hopefully a positive one for the West. Um, and I think it'll take probably five to ten years to for Russia to get back to where they were two years ago. But um, yeah. China? China's another interesting one because geopolitically with Taiwan, the US is standing fully behind Taiwan. I don't think T China will do anything in Taiwan. I think the US has kind of told them don't even think about it. Um, and I don't think they want to do about do anything about it. It'd be pretty scary if China ended up the the world superpower, wouldn't it? It would. It would. And it, it, you know, they're growing rapidly. I mean, the US is onshoring an awful lot of semiconductor plants and a lot of strategic things they're bringing them back from Asia now. Uh, a lot of production that did happen in places like Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan is going to be back on shores. Do you think we're going to end up, I was talking about this, um, so 43% of the UK's energy supply is renewable, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, very little's coming from Russia, I think it's like less than 5%. Yeah. So the UK really, for me, should be pursuing energy independence mm -hmm. i think also we need food independence as well because the pandemic um the conflict all of this stuff has shown that our way of life is very much dependent on an a world order that we can't necessarily bank on working all the time right so I think absolutely we need energy independence, food independence, which is what the U.S. is doing mm -hmm. effectively. They're making themselves be able to look after themselves and what they buy from abroad is a bonus. Do you think that's realistic for the U.K.? I think it is realistic for the U.K., particularly around energy. And it started, it's been going on for several years now. You know, we've got plenty of solar uh, and plenty of wind, not enough. Um, you're right, we don't get a lot of gas from Russia. We get There's nuclear in the mix as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think food security is it probably my more of a concern, if you will. But, you know, our farming and our I, agriculture I was shocked pretty good that as well. a third of the world's grain 
something like that comes from the Ukraine and Russia. Right, right. Like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty scary. Yeah, it is. It is. I think that you know a lot of things have happened in the last two or three years or f- five years, really, since Brexit was on the agenda, and a lot of countries are looking inward. They're becoming more nationalistic. The U.S. is one, and the U.K. is is clearly another. And other other countries are doing the same as well. China's doing the same as well to some extent. Um, that may not necessarily be a good thing. I'm more of a laissez-faire, open market, global kind of person. But it is a phase that we're going into. And globalization has not served a lot of people well, mm-hmm. um, which is unfortunate. So, you know, energy independence, food independence is going to be front and center for the next decade. I think where we buy our, you know, uh, you know, Taiwan's responsible for a lot of semiconductors, which is mobile phones, computers, mm-hmm. cars. I think we have to look at, Okay, how given we never thought we'd have a war in Europe, we never thought that would actually happen. Um, albeit everybody said, you know, Russia wants the Ukraine back. We knew it, but we never thought it would really happen. Right. And then obviously, China and Taiwan, we kind of have to think, okay, where can we trade where we know there is some sustainability of this situation if we're going to base our society on it? Mm-hmm. You, no. can, you kind of got to think what is unthinkable and then adapt accordingly. You know, yeah. we didn't think there was going to be a war. There probably won't, we probably won't run out of oil, but we could run out of oil. So you kind of need to think uh, on, on all manner of things, whether it's food, energy, geopolitical, what could happen, it probably won't happen, but then, you know, adapt and build strategies around what can we do, bringing it back to business. You know, if I've got four customers, they're all good. But what if one of them goes away? Suddenly we lose a third of our business. And you've got to be thinking that way. Problems always to... come in threes. Yeah, threes. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've got to risk reduce that opportunity yeah. cost to your business. So you need to be back filling that client opportunity. What if Joe doesn't turn up for work tomorrow? He's gone to someone else. You need to be back filling. You need to be thinking about, you know, back filling resources and customers and systems. And you need to be thinking ahead. You need to be thinking strategically. And if your finance person is not supporting you do that, you need to find an advisor that can help you do that. And that might be a non-executive director. It might be a, a coach or a mentor, if you will. But you need to be thinking longer term than just this week or this month. You need to be thinking 2024, 2025, where am I going to get that client opportunity? Where is the demand going to come from? Where is the business going to be? Where should we be? Where are we, be, where are we going to find the people to put these solar panels on the roof that we're going to import from China? Well, we need to train more people. So you need to go to Petrock and Exeter College. You need to find these people. So you need to put them into training schemes. So you need to be thinking ahead. And, and I think one of the things that business isn't currently doing is they're thinking very short term at the moment. Mm-hmm. And we need to think a lot more six, nine, 12 months, two to five years out and think about where you want to take the business to. Um, one of the first questions I ask with any client is, where do you want to take this business? What do you want to do with it? And what's the timeline? And then we'll work back from where you want to be in 10 years, whether you want to give your business to your kids or sell it, merge it, let's scale the business. Let's work back from that time on that timeline of what do we need to put in place ahead of that, whether that's systems, people, processes, strategy, uh, marketing, creating market opportunities in order for you to achieve what you want to achieve in in your business and Mm -hmm. achieve the objectives you've got for that business. I guess if you don't have a plan, you'll be working somebody else's. Well, plan to fail if you don't have a plan. And and ultimately, I think the message from this is change is, is constant and relying on the status quo to just repeat itself is is. A fool's game, basically. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm second that. Yeah. You didn't say it like that, but I did. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, thank you so much for coming on. Um, if people want to find you, you're a LinkedIn addict, right? Yep. Something so, like that. Find uh, me on we'll LinkedIn. put your details around with this uh, video so you can kind of all find Rob and um, uh, seek out all of his opinions. But more importantly, if you're looking at where does the future go for your business and you want somebody alongside you who will... We'll give you the dose of reality, but we'll also be pragmatic about how you get to where you want to be. Rob's your man. Rob, thank you. Pleasure.